if you're being strategic, okay. Um, if you're being strategic, if you don't have all the time in the world, if you'd like to do as much as possible, uh, as quickly as possible, it would not be crazy for you to, by the end of class today, be thinking during class, what do I want to analyze? You, you should be formulating a target question and you should be imagining the kind of situation you want to look at uh, in your analysis, because that's the big payoff of this week's for the work. So it wouldn't be crazy to set as a target goal for the lecture is to have an idea what question you're going to be looking at, the target question, question three. And the second thing, be great to have a sense of what kind of image, what kind of project you're looking for. Does that make sense? Okay, so that, Camila, uh, Camila, that's the question, that's the analysis that I encourage you to uh, be thinking about during this class, during this lecture. For the term project, you should ponder this you know, in a larger time frame sense. So, the reason, one of the reasons I want the laptop closed is I get the sense sometimes I say something and one of you will say, well, what? What did you just say? What was that? Can you say that again? That sounded important. And my reaction is, wait a minute. All of this is important. And this week, like previously, we looked at informal settlements, which is a pretty new thing or self-produced neighborhoods as we call them now. This is a pretty new thing. It's really kind of just emerged since the 70s. Informal, informality, generating self-produced neighborhoods. It's a new thing. And in the future, this is the past, and this is the future, we're orienting this class towards your career space. We want you to be ready to tackle the problems that people throw at you. So informality is a thing that is coming to the US, it's spreading all over the world. It is a thing. Some version of self-produced neighborhoods is in our future. We're doing it now. And Boston is one of the places we're doing it. Uh, we're also talking about uh, race, the legacy of racial segregation in the United States. We talk about the automobile, which for some reason, has been a blind spot for architects because that's not our job. We just do what society tells us to do. We reproduce the mindset of automobile dependence in everything we do. Every time we build a building uh, anywhere beyond the reach of mass transit, we are reproducing automobile dependence that is responsible larger than any other force for the death of the planet. Right? So if you're looking for what causes uh, climate change, who do we blame? We blame ourselves. We blame the architects because we reproduce that mindset in most of what we do. And that needs to change. Now we're going to the Radiant Garden City Beautiful. <clears throat> and on this topic, so when you get to your firms and your your high paying jobs, relatively high paying jobs, right? When you graduate. This will be new to your boss. Your boss is an older guy. Sorry, it's the chances. Chances about high, high percentage likelihood. Your boss is an older white male, like me. And your older white male boss doesn't know anything about informality and could not care less, it has nothing to do with what in his mind has nothing to do with what the firm does. Race, also not our problem. We don't do that. Automobility, uh, his response will be, what's wrong with the automobile? Why, why are you attacking me? You know, so 
these things are new and foreign to the power structures of the architecture profession, unless you're really lucky and you work for a firm with younger principals and younger bosses and a diversity of, of the hierarchy. So, um, but these are the kinds of things that we need to tackle moving forward. This week, Radiant City Model of Corbusier, Garden City Model of Ebenezer Howard, the City Beautiful Movement of the Chicago World's Fair, all of these things are very well known to the current hierarchy of the architectural profession. When you show up at the job, uh, they will say, well, you know, Team 10, you know, eyes on the street, you know, streets in the air, you know, uh, towers in the park. The whole vocabulary of the architectural profession is infused with the ideas that we're talking about this week. And it's shocking to us and the people I work with when employers come to us and say, uh, your graduates don't seem to know the basics of these principles. And we say, well, I don't know why that is. We teach it. We actually uh, teach it several times throughout the curriculum. Uh, so I don't have an explanation for that. So that's one reason why. So there's a lot at stake for the program in general, for you guys to go out into the world and not just nod your head because you know about these things. But if no one else is bringing it up, you bring it up, right? You say, well, sure, in the 60s, that's what we would have done. But nowadays, don't we, don't we know better? Don't we know? And then here we go, your one sentence, your moment of truth, you say in one sentence, you provide an alternative to what uh, would have happened if you didn't work there. And you say, how about if we do this instead? How about if we provide, and the thing we do instead of the Radiant Garden City Beautiful is we do human scale. So the punchline of this whole, really your architectural education, but we're focusing on it this week, is we build for human scale. And why is that so radical? Well, that sounds tough. Of course we build for human scale. Why is that radical? Someone say it and that'll count as your question. Why is it radical to build for the human scale? Yes. Historically, cities have been designed to, from afar, from like an aerial view, look beautiful or magnificent, and often the tables go from the bottom. Does that make sense? Is that familiar? You could, I could have said that, right? That's what you're thinking. Didn't, didn't have it. For design, you design not to have the So it's a, an arrogance thing? Uh huh. Yeah. Anything else? Yes. Uh, yeah, like Roussier would in his blood he said that he would like to compartmentalize everybody as a human subject and sort of simplify and then he's to meet his time and stuff. Mm -hmm. and, like you would say he wants to like redo education. And uh like doing that is sort of moving away from the scale, moving towards like his own urban scale instead. Yeah. Yeah, the the moving away from the human scale to be bigger than uh, mere humans. Uh, it's kind of an ambition that came up during the 20th century um, that manifested in the way we design architecture, streets, urban neighborhoods, 
and entire cities. And when I say entire cities, what I'm really talking about are the combination of two factors, urban infrastructures like highways, trains, uh, street networks, and zoning rules. Those are the two tools of city design. That is the realm of urban planning. So we're gonna talk about urban planning and the, the existence of urban planning is uh, a important excuse why architects would, uh, give ourselves a break. We don't need to take care of any of these larger scale things because that's what urban planners do. Not so fast. One of the things we're gonna look at in this lecture is how did that happen? Because uh, there was no such thing as urban planning uh, in 1800. Urban planning was invented in uh, this period of the late 1800s and it was institutionalized in the 20th century and architecture went from what it historically did and it shrank down to something much smaller. And uh, a few years ago, uh, the dean of the school said, Robert, can you figure, can you make a proposal for a new urban, a new uh, graduate degree program? And I said, sure, I can do that. That's what I do in my spare time. I love proposing new graduate degree programs. And then the next thing he said was, can you propose a graduate degree program in city and regional planning or urban planning? And I said, Yes, of course, because that's what you're supposed to say. You always start with yes. And you don't say yes, but. You say yes, and. That's pro move. Because what I'm thinking is, what? Are you crazy? That is the problem, is urban planning. There's no, the last thing in the world I will do is propose a program in urban planning. That is the problem with the world. And it's the problem of architecture. And uh, so I didn't say that. This is how you should approach it too. You should say yes. And I'm going to expand the idea of urban planning to, be, to move beyond the design of regional infrastructures and zoning maps to be more holistic. And that's what I said. And that's what we're doing. Long story short, we are in the midst of developing a master of urbanism. Why is it urbanism and not urban planning? Urban planning is a profession defined by the Associated Collegiate Schools of Planning, ACSP, and they define the profession of urban planning by defining the curriculum of urban planning. And the curriculum of urban planning is very much locked in place the way it was during the 20th century with some expansion into participatory design projects, et cetera, which are, is very good, but it's not enough, it's too slow, and it's limited. It's based on the idea that you can't ask graduate students to study everything. Uh, you have to limit what you try to do. You have to limit it to zoning and infrastructure. And the infrastructure that we do is roads and freeways. And the zoning we do are single use zones. And that's what we're talking about today, is how did those two tools of urban planning uh, get us in a position, you know, because, and this is one of the benefits of moving backwards. We look at the world uh, with very frank and open eyes about all the problems that we are inherit, you are inheriting. We're saying these problems are serious. They did not come from nowhere. And by going through the history in reverse chronological order, we get to be honest and frank about how this history connects to where we are now. That's what we're doing this, this week. And uh, strap in because typically, uh, in the historic version of this course, the way uh, it's been taught for decades and the way it's still taught in too many places, uh, we spend a week on City Beautiful Movement, and then we move forward in time 
uh, and we look at the Garden City's ideas of Ebenezer Howard and the English New Towns movement. And then we move forward in time and spend a third week on Corbusier's ideas of the Radiant City. And um, maybe we mention at the very end, if there's time, Jane Jacobs and Jan Giel and this critique uh, by James C. Scott, who's this brilliant guy, my hero. Um, this book that he wrote, Seen Like a State, has made it into architecture school curricula. And it is a very important pivot point where we can be very critical instead of just replicating Corbusier's urban ideas or the ideas embedded in our built environment. We can now take a critical look. We're given the tools by James C. Scott, by Jane Jacobs, by Jan Giel to, uh, to take a critical look at where we're at, how we got here and what to do now. So that's what we're doing. So Caitlin, you got your question? Okay. So here we go. Um, street is architecture. Let's start locally. We know this place, right? Yes. Thank you. Wow. So um, we did the whole pepper spray test. Let's do a quick pepper spray test analysis of this environment. Uh, you're a woman, and your parents care about you. They gave you pepper spray when you were going out to the big city. And you're going from Ruggles Station. Uh, it's dark out. And you're going to your, your dorm. I don't know. Maybe it's over here. There dorm there's dorms over here. So you're going to your dorm over here. Get off at Ruggles. And where do you go? How many people? Go straight, the shortest distance. Let's let's let the man answer as we can. Raise your hand if you go straight through on the campus. It's late at night. The woman wants love you. The pepper spray. Get off at Ruggles. You're going to your dorm here. Which way do you go? If I'm a woman. Yeah, you're a woman. <laughs> we, this is uh, rule number one of the ethical practice of architecture is you have empathy for all users. I will ask you to be a homeless person. I will ask you to be a fentanyl addict. I will ask you to be an eight-year-old child. I think anyone walking near us at night is a pepper spray. I agree. So that's but, Let's come to the point with this. You said your homeless. No, 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 no. We're, we're not doing homeless now. We're doing more homeless. So you're an architect. So you need to do two things. You need to say, you need to, to the best of your ability, imagine what it's like to be a woman. Second thing is no, that you cannot ever know what it's like to be a woman. Those two things seem contradictory, but that is the world we live in. That's my point. Walk to Northeastern campus. Why? Explain. You can get through with the escalator. All right. You don't have to go across and then see if you know. So, um, so help Mike out, man. What's the mindset? Where do we go? Um, I think this will. It's a lot safer, right? Yeah. Austin. And it's a busier area for some of the problems. Right. And even if it's not busier, it seems busy, doesn't it? Yes. There's like more eyes on the street. Yes. It was designed by William Braun in the 90s to produce an eyes on the street <clears throat> to produce a series of outdoor rooms. It's well lit. It's surveilled by cameras and by uh, guards, but beyond the cameras and the guards, because cameras are useless. The guards are late. The real security comes from actual human beings occupying the place or our ability to project and imagine that there are human beings behind 
some of those windows. There's lots of windows facing this entire walk through here. Lots of windows. And we can imagine that there are people behind some of those windows. Now you're a fentanyl addict and you need, you need your next hit, right? It's a disease, okay? So don't be judging. I'm a fentanyl addict. I need my next hit. It's a disease. I'm the victim here, right? But what am I going to do? There's no uh, programs. I'm going to rob somebody. Where do I go to rob somebody? Ruggles. Why? It's all the reasons why a, a smart human, woman or not, smart person who knows that there's not self-destructive, you know, whose parents love them, goes through here and uh, not through here. Okay, so you see, you need, if you have empathy for the fentanyl addict and you have access to the, the criminal mind set, understanding that you don't have, there's no way you can understand the criminal mindset, but you try because you're an architect. This is where you lay in wait because there's lots of places to hide. Where do you hide if you're a fentanyl addict? If you want to rob someone, where do you hide? In a bush. In a bush. Shrubbery is the fentanyl, is the criminal's favorite architectural feature. So where do we find bushes? There are zero bushes along William Ron's award-winning design of West Village in Northeast. Zero, no shrubbery. But when you cross the street, where do you, where do you, where do you get? Where's the shrubbery? Wentworth and shrubbery. Wentworth loves the shrubbery. <laughs> we love the shrubbery. Shrubbery, 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 shrubbery. It's grown up since this photo. There is a, I saw it coming in. It's a big hedge. Thank you, Wentworth, says the criminal. And eyes on the street? None. There's a building here, eyes on the street? doesn't matter if these classrooms, single use zoning, these classrooms are empty at 9.30 at night. And I can tell because the lights are out, even the cleaning crews not on the right? Plus, that's like 120 feet away from the sidewalk and there's lots of shrubbery here. It's a parking lot. I can, criminals can hide behind the cars. Which side of the street do you walk on? This side, please people, take care of yourselves. Do not walk on the side of the street. Okay, this is what your parents said. Walk on this side of the street. Why? Safety. Eyes on the street. The pepper spray test. Both sides of that. The other side is still a hard part. Both sides of the street. Right. So this side is not great, but it's better than this side. Um, because at least uh, if I'm a fentanyl addict, I'm not going to hide in the traffic lane and then jump out of you. I might hide here and jump over the chain link fence of the church, which is empty and dark. But where do we get some relief? As we're walking down here, it's like, if only I can get to Ira Allen, right? But what, what is the front of Ira Allen? Right. Busy road is not as bad, unless it's bubbles. <laughs> because it's busier enough that You're walking there and you're getting mud, it's your own fault, right? This is what I say as the driver. <laughs> right? So so where do where where do we hope like we get to Ira Allen and the base of the building is parsley on the pig? You know parsley on the pig? You serve up the suckling pig and then you garnish it with parsley around the base of the pig. That's what Ira Allen is. Ira Allen is parsley on the pig. That, that unsightly foundation, two or three feet of foundation wall, we don't like that. So we put parsley around the base of the pig. We put shrubbery at the base of our buildings to hide that unsightly seam between the foundations and the buildings. That is 
good place for criminals. And you can hide stolen bicycles there. You can use all kinds of things that that supports. And then we get here, what happens here? It's trees instead of shrubbery. It's trees instead of shrubbery. The only thing I can hide behind is a bench and that huge fire department connection sign next to the bench. Um, but there's a wall of glass behind me. <laughs> I'm a fentanyl addict, but I'm not an idiot. Right? I'm not going to hide. I'm not going to try to victimize anyone here. And I know that as a young person uh, walking here, I know I'm okay here. Right? But what happens here? Not even Everything goes wrong. Chain link fence, shrubbery. Oh, they took out the chain link fence. Yeah. To their credit. Shrubbery, no windows, in concrete block. So please, nobody walk here at night. Please. I beg you. Don't walk here at night. So you see how this works? You one of the first things you'll be asked to do if you haven't been asked to do it already is to work on a project where the architectural team asked to design something for here or for there or wherever there's a parking lot that um, they want to convert into a building because that's what parking lots are for. It's something to do with a piece of land where you're waiting for the architectural team to finish their design for actually a building, which is the proper use of land in a place like Boston, right? So I don't know if you know the history of this, but in the in the 80s and 90s, the uh, administration of Wentworth was seriously looking at moving the campus to, out of Boston to the suburbs. They really they, they were going to do it. They were absolutely committed. They did not like being in Boston. They were they were suburban people. They and they did not like being in the city. The city was a bad place to be from a marketing point of view. Uh, Parents from the suburbs don't want to send their kids into the city and put them in harm's way. So they were going to move the campus. They were very close to succeeding. It fell apart. So they had to stay in Boston. And as a compromise, they took one of the most valuable pieces of land in New England and they converted it to an almost regulation qualifying soccer field. And the reason they did that is so they could take photographs of the campus from here that emphasized the suburban qualities of the campus. So this lawn that is really strategic for criminals to victimize un unwitting victims is also exactly the physical architectural form that we needed to market the campus as a suburban environment, ironically enough. Isn't that interesting? So this is very typical of, of the kind of situations we confront in the 21st century. I want, before we move on from the side slide, I want to point out this. I want to plant a target question. Why, what, why? Why would a building, why would this building why would these buildings, why would all these buildings, all of these buildings, why would they turn at an angle to the street? Well, the shade is drawn. This is one of the few places. Hmm? We're not gonna answer it now, but that's good. We'll, we'll keep taking bids. So um, this is a building, this could be anywhere, it's in Pasadena, California. Um, this is the kind of building that is produced for very logical reasons. It's not crazy to design a building this way. If you're just looking at zoning rules, and the way architecture firms approach buildings, we need, uh, we, let's say we have uh, 200 employees, each employee 
needs uh, 350 square feet. This is money in the bank for you, write this down. 350 square feet per employee. That includes hallways, bathrooms, corridors, uh, stairwells, elevators, break rooms, conference rooms. If you have 100 employees, you're gonna need uh, 35,000 square feet, right? See how I did that math? I just added two zeros and it makes 35,000, okay? Now, uh, this is in Pasadena. They have a, a, well, now they have light rail and they have a good bus system, but when it was built, they didn't. How many of those 100 employees are going to uh, walk or take a bus or do anything but drive to work? Yeah, maybe, maybe one, maybe three. So basically, you need space for the cars. Um, so that's how much space for each employee, you know, in the building, air condition, and everything. How much space do we need for cars? How much space do you think? Fourteen feet by eight feet is a good parking space, right? What's that? What's the math of that? Let's say it's 15 by 10 or eight by 20 is actually with a lot of parking standards set. So 160 square feet, but wait, what about the driveway? Because we don't want to do what they do underneath the high line, which is they, they block, you know, you put your car in, then the next car goes right behind it and the third car goes behind that. And then because they want to make more money, they take that first car and they lift it up on a structure and bring the second car into that and then they do it again. So we don't want to do that here, right? Fourth Amendment rights. Right? I get to park wherever I want for free. Look it up. No, you don't have to look it up. There is no God-given right to free parking in the United States guaranteed by the US Bill of Rights. We just act like it is. That's a cultural norm that we take for granted, we grow up with it, and then we reproduce it. Free parking wherever you want, whenever you want, okay? What is the fourth amendment? Um, no, quarter. no, no quartering. Search. Right, you, you're not, because of the American Revolution where the British forces could come to your house and say, you need to put us up, empty your bedrooms, and we're going to sleep there, and you need to feed us, right? So the Fourth Amendment says you don't need to do that. It's search and seizures. Oh, it is? And they also, no one thinks about that, so it's available for us to slot in the right to drive a car and park where we want. Okay. So cut to the chase, it's 450 square feet per car given the driveways and the turnaround and everything. So add two zeros to that. For so, so this explains our Houston picture. Remember our Houston picture? Where the city is empty, 85% of the land area is for cars and 15% for everything else. This is how we get there because what can we do as architects with those 35,000 square feet? We can stack it up, it's really easy. It doesn't take much space to go up and down stairs and elevators. How about cars? Can we stack up cars? Yeah, we can, but then it goes from 450 square feet to 650 square feet. As soon as you start to stack, you need ramps. And all of a sudden you, you need more space. It's super expensive. It costs something like $60,000 to put a parking spot on the ground something like $200,000 to stack up the parking. Thank you, Wentworth. When we move the soccer field to a parking lot, the parking is sacrosanct. You should hear my colleagues in the meetings when the president of Wentworth implies that they might consider reducing the amount of parking that Wentworth provides by one spot. All hell breaks this. So thank you for your tuition donations to our parking subsidy program, $200,000 per parking space. 
to put stack up parking under our so soccer field, which hopefully will at least be regulation size now, right? We don't know. So the parking is underground and the entrance to the building set back, uh, most people come and go through the parking garage. So there might be a door here for people to go and, and eat lunch uh, if they're willing to walk a quarter mile in the Pasadena sun. Um, but that front door, those glass doors might be locked with no one watching it and you just call to get in. I'm not sure. I should go there next time in the Pasadena. But um, if you're a criminal, does this, so does this pass the pepper spray test? No. no. For all the reasons we talked about. Is that, that clear? This is what we do as architects. We evaluate the built environment according to the viewpoints of users, the most vulnerable users, the historically least served users in our society. That's what we do. So um, we want to earn the right. This is your goal. And we've, we've gotten a good start on it. We want as a profession, as a society to earn the right to say that except for a very short period of time between World War II and the 21st century, except for a very short period of temporary insanity, we designed the streets of our cities as a social space except for a very short period of time between World War II and the turn of the 21st century, we created our cities that catered and served and supported the experiences of the most vulnerable uh, citizens of our society, if you're white. You have to add that asterisk. So we want to earn the right to say, except for a very short period of time, we did things well. We designed for the human scale. We designed as if humans were our clients, regardless of who was paying our commissions, we serve humanity and we serve uh, all, everyone and not just the wealthy clients. We use their money to design, to support the design and construction, but, uh, we're serving everybody's needs. All stakeholders are our, our clients. And so this is uh, the, the picture we use to refer to uh, most of human history when our cities were social spaces. The streets were designed as social spaces. If the 17 buildings of this street are already built and there's one place missing and you are the architect of that one place, you don't just design it in isolation in your AutoCAD uh, environment and ignore the fact that of everything else, you design in addition to this ensemble of buildings such that this environment gets better. You reinforce the things we like and you correct the problems that we identify. That's what architects do. That's what architects have always done, except for a brief moment of temporary insanity between World War II and 2000. And that's the goal of your generation, is to earn the right to reconnect the profession of architecture to its larger tradition and its larger ethical responsibility for designing the world a human, the built environment for uh, a more complete and holistic understanding of society. So these are classic examples of carefully designed urban environments. We study Michelangelo's Campidoglio Hill. We don't know what's going on in any of these buildings. It doesn't matter, except that there are things going on. There are activities in the windows. These are active facades looking at uh, an activated outdoor room. This is an outdoor room. It's at the scale of human experience. This is the star of the show. This is not the star of the show. This is the star of the show. 
And that is often the case. When Lears Weinsapel designed the CEIS building, it's a great building. Uh, and if you go in, it works very well. And I've had to change the way I teach because of that building. I used to teach that a building can only be as good as the client allows it to be. And Wentworth is a notoriously stingy, narrow-minded client. There's not so much you can do. You can't do a good building if Wentworth is your client. They will make sure they will stop it from happening. Well, Tom Chong, who teaches here, have you had Tom? You'll have a chance to have Tom. Tom Chung, who was the project architect of the CIS building, jujitsued Wentworth stinginess. Wentworth said, no, none of the social gathering places. We want corridors that take you from point A to point B, and we want a laboratory. And we want bigger laboratories, smaller corridors, smaller social spaces. And Lewis Weinsaffel said, but, 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 we need places for students to gather informally. We need the natural interplay between people walking by and their friends there and they stop and they have a conversation and we need that kind of social mixing bowl kind of thing. Went and said, no, stop it. Uh, corridors, laboratories, bathrooms, and, and offices, generous, beautiful offices for all our beautiful, well-paid vice presidents. We're constantly adding more vice presidents and more adjunct faculty to pay for those vice presidents. That's what we want. And Tom Chung jujitsu that whole arrangement. He made every corridor slightly wider. He made corridors that are shaped like this. And so there are places throughout that building where you can gather. And uh, so now I have to say that as an architect, it's our job to show possibilities where the client sees no possibility. You have to change the range of options. You have to alter the decision space of clients and offer them things that they couldn't imagine previously. And even the worst client you can imagine will do the right thing. Thank you, Tom Chung. So this is about, this is, what is this called? Do you know what this map is? Noli map of Rome. Thank you. Do you know that? You've talked about it? How do you know that? Oh, <laughs> you still get points because you're willing to talk. I just, I get so lonely up here. So the Noli map is a famous thing. What year was it? Can't remember. Thank you. Um, so the Noli map of Rome didn't have the yellow because they didn't have yellow back then. They didn't invent yellow until later. Um, no, it's just expensive to print. So this is a lithograph uh, produced in 1748, uh, I'm told. And this, is, this gets to that issue of public-private that came up on Tuesday, right? When is the public-private binary, the one zero, yes, no, public, private. Uh, when is that wrong? When there's such a thing as semi-public, semi-private, all of the gradients, the, the shades of gray of all of the public and private. These are the interior public spaces. A lot of them are churches. What's this? What's this building here? The Pantheon, how did you know? This is the Pantheon, remember the Pantheon? Um, so this is Rome, Pantheon. These are the public spaces that are interior. It's like the shopping mall of uh, the 18th century. Uh, and so this is a way of depicting the urban fabric. Depict the urban fabric as if it's architecture is a central theme of what we teach in studio now. The Noli map is not just a figure ground. You've heard the term figure ground drawing. So a Noli map is an extension of figure ground drawing 
it shows, it depicts the interior, accessible interior areas uh, in this way. Uh, one of my great heroes in this world is Weldon Priest, who taught at Wentworth for 30 years. And for 15 of those 30 years, he led every architecture student uh, first semester junior year in what is called the urban studio, what was called the urban studio. And the first six weeks of the urban studio, students painstakingly drew these pencil drawings of uh, urban architecture, of streets. These were called the street studies. And Weldon has a great wealth of these things. He's very stingy about sharing them. He's trying to make it a book. And in the meantime, even though I taught the course with him for several years, um, I don't have access to higher resolution versions of it. But the analysis project that you guys are doing are a digital outgrowth of these street studies. Each one of these street study projects took six weeks and it, of studio. It was very heavy lifting for students. And uh, our mandate is to do it more quickly. Instead of six weeks, we do it in six hours. That's the idea of the analysis assignment. But basically by drawing the city in this way, we're taking a street, we're suppressing the information of the private realm, but keeping it there for context. And we're emphasizing the, pub <coughs> the public architectures that we want to look at and learn from. And so we draw it in this way so that the eye moves away from these lighter bits of context and is attracted to examine and look at what we need to look at. So this is uh, the graphic, the black and white line drawing version of the colored overlays. At least that's the idea. So we, we suppress the depiction of the private spaces and we bring out to the form final the depiction of the public spaces. In the Noli map, in the street studies by Weldon Priest. And this is more of it. <clears throat> this is Copenhagen. These are pencil drawings, uh, figure ground, roof plans, uh, oblique aerial perspectives. These are the type of views we use in our analysis work. And <clears throat> a ground plane Noli map depiction of the public realm. And then the same thing in an urban section. A figure ground depiction of the expansion of the city of Copenhagen. <clears throat> so the street as architecture is, that's the thing we want to get back to. Where did, how did we go wrong? So um, did you look at the city of Paris? Did you look at the city of Paris in History 32? I see a nodding head yes. Two nodding heads yes. That's a yes or no. It's a yes. How many people did not look at the streets of Paris in History 32. You did? Do you remember this? And was I the teacher? Was I the teacher? You had it a year earlier, right? I was the teacher. I looked it up. You were my students. <laughs> they, I know I see this guy before. How can I forget him? I knew that he was looked familiar somewhere. <laughs> so because I was the teacher and you were the students, and because these are the slides I showed you, we can go quickly through this. Right? Remember the seven reasons Hausman's transformation of Paris? Remember it? Remember it? <laughs> Thank you. So these are the seven reasons. It 
So when the street, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna teach uh, in a series of takeaways, right? So these are takeaway messages from big swaths of history. We already had the street as architecture, right? We have the street as architecture and at the scale of the street, how do we know it's human scale? What are the scale of the five senses? And what are the other senses we have? How do we experience the world? We experience the world in the closest proximity, probably by eating it, right? We taste things, we smell things. The distance of taste is zero, it's in our mouths, right? The distance of smelling is, well, it depends on whether it's an industrial stench or not, but it's, it's a variable scale. What's the scale of hearing? It's a different scale, maybe a hundred feet. If someone's really loud or if someone's whispering, it might be two feet, right? So there's, there's a scale, the important takeaway message here, is that there's a scale related to each of the senses. And there's a scale of the sense of moving through space. And the way we are meant to experience, the way biologically our apparatus for experiencing the world is by walking. We experience the scale of walking. We experience the scale of walking. What is the scale of walking? Whether you have some space sense. No. Um, how far can we walk? The scale. Human scale, how far? Half mile or so. Have you ever, do you walk a half mile on a regular basis? Like a half mile trip, I can do that. Between the dorm and here, that's half a mile, right? A little less. So I don't know why my son never walks to campus, but that's a half mile. And if I, you know, I live. Hmm? Half mile changes depending on where you are. Like if it's against a busy road, that's not a half mile. I don't want to walk because it's like through halfway. So if. Uh, if that half mile walk involves taking my life in my hands, it feels longer and I'm not going to do it, right? It could be the last quarter mile you ever walk because you don't make it to a full half mile, right? So if you're at risk of being killed or harmed, you're not going to walk even a half mile. Well, even if it's just like a straight little there's no shade covered, like no one's going to want to walk that during the day. Exactly. If there's no shade cover, it's longer. If it's along the emerald necklace, how far can we walk? I can walk six miles if it's in the emerald necklace. That's my favorite part of the day, right? Maybe not six miles, but I'll walk two miles in the emerald necklace and it will feel about as far as a quarter mile uh, in a dangerous place. So that's a crucial. Uh, lesson for how the human scale works. So the human scale of walking will change according to the quality of the environment that, of the experience, okay? What about the sense of sight? What is the scale of the sense of sight? How far is that? It's pretty far. Jan Giel is gonna tell us that the sense of sight, the human scale, of sight is about 100 feet or 100 meters, I think he says. 100 meters is like a square, a town square. That's the human scale that he calls the human scale of sight. But uh, back in, uh, in Catholic Rome, the Jubilee year of 1500, who's Catholic? who was raised Catholic? So do you know about indulgences? Do you know about purgatory? What's purgatory? So we die, we go to purgatory. Okay, I'm, I'm yes, Kate. Um, Limbo. It's limbo. Yeah. Yeah. Purgatory is where we go when we die. 
And according to the Catholic Church in 1500, and for most of the history of Catholic Catholicism, you can earn indulgences that would take time off of your time in purgatory. You can do that by walking the Camino uh, to Santiago, Spain. Awesome. Very cool. You don't have to be Catholic. It's good for its own purposes, whether or not indulgences or purgatory or heaven and hell are real or not. Very cool thing to do. Um, if you came to Rome in the Jubilee year 1500, you got 200% bonus points of indulgences off your time in purgatory. If you came to Rome and walked the pilgrimage routes between the seven holy sites of Rome. So they published this pamphlet and they depicted each of the seven holy sites of Rome. And they said, you can walk straight from one to the other. It set up this idea of axial visual corridors. So the idea of the visual corridor of the boulevards that are at the core of the city beautiful movement, that's where it comes from. That's a takeaway. And we see it in Hausmann's Paris. We see it in the Palace of Versailles. Uh, we see it, uh, the transformation of Paris is all about putting, step one, put an architectural monument at the end of the visual corridor and cut uh, straight visual sight lines to connect it so that we have the human scale experience. So we're walking down the street, turn the corner, to, wow, look at that. The Lac de Triomphe, Charles Elysee. I have a visual corridor. It's it's three kilometers away, but I see it there, and I'm walking towards it. It's a big deal. And then we talked about uh, Garnier's um, Opera House. We cut these boulevards right through. Where do we cut them through? We cut them through the poor working class neighborhoods that we want to get rid of. That those criminals out of the city. Uh, same as Robert Moses did with the Cross Bronx Expressway, and to make the city safe. Remember this section? We segregate vertically within the building. Servants, the Piano Nobile, the first floor, it has a higher ceiling. This is one of our favorite drawings from Street Theory, too, isn't it? You remember that. So, all of this stuff, Garnier's uh, Opera House. We cut through to make a visual corridor to Garnier's Opera House. This is the primary distinctive move of uh, the city beautiful movement. And we do it in Paris, and then we do it in Vienna, and then we do it uh, in Barcelona. Uh, but in Barcelona, we have a slightly different arrangement where we're actually trying to deal with housing and the way the housing is designed in Barcelona and uh, is that you have access in these apartments to a garden interior and the public street of the exterior. This is a semi-public area uh, and this is a public area. So there are shades of gray, in public and private. The idea is that every apartment has access to both levels of privacy, publicness. It didn't work out that way. Some of us are going to go look at that in the fall. So I'll move forward. Uh, the City Beautiful Movement came to the United States in the World Columbian Exposition of 1893. And one of the things that the architecture was designed to produce was a sense of human history, especially the story of Western civilization that justifies white supremacy and colonialism, is that the Greeks were the great philosophers and great minds of human civilization. They passed on their greatness to Rome. Rome passed on its greatness. Let's ignore the, the whole Islamic civilization that flourished between Rome and the rise of Europe. Um, we have it, that's part of the strategy is you erase the history of Islamic civilization in this process. Um, but the fact is, we'll, we'll get into Islam in a few weeks. But if it weren't for the great universities, libraries, and mathematicians of Islam, we wouldn't have a connection to the Greek philosophers. They're the ones who preserved all the writings of the Greeks in their libraries. If it weren't for the Islamic uh, veneration of higher learning and science, 
all of that would be lost to history and we wouldn't have it. It would be gone. But because of those, we called it the dark ages, what we should be calling it is the golden age of Islamic civilization. And the cities of Europe, many of them were Islamic centers of learning all throughout Spain, especially. Um, so, uh, but this story is one of the greatness of white supremacy going from Greece to Rome to, and then we had as many centuries of competition between England, France, Germany, the countries of Europe, but let's just say Europe. So Europe was handed the greatness that was Greece, Rome, Europe. And then in 1876, the United States was up and coming and we needed to be more than just this industrial powerhouse of the uh, heartland of the US, which is the most fertile, most productive farmland in the world. Everything was coming out of the Midwest, going to the Mississippi River, uh, up to Chicago, to the Great Lakes, and either across the Erie Canal or through the, we'll talk about this in weeks to come. But Chicago especially was this uh, machine for transforming the commodity wealth of the middle of the United States into cash money. And so Chicago had uh, the stockyards and a lot of money, a lot of industrial capacity, but it didn't, it was just a factory for creating wealth. And they wanted more than that. So they said, we want to be, we want the United States to be the, the, uh, the banner carrier of white supremacy uh, that is the inheritance from Greece and Rome in Europe, and we want to be the cultured place of civilization, of Western civilization. And so New York, Washington, Chicago, San Francisco uh, were all transformed by the architecture to create that message. And you will recognize what we're doing here. This is once again, project system culture. If you need to transform the United States into the banner carrier of Western civilization, who are you going to call? Ghostbusters? No, you're going to call the architects. And so they called the architects, and this is what the architects did. And they said, we can give you a project that is a vehicle for the transformation of the system of societies, and we can transform the culture of the United States from these pioneer, rough, in, rugged individuals to the harbinger of what, the carrier of the torch of Western civilization. And that's what the, the World Columbian Exposition of Chicago in 1893 did. And I can skim over the top and just talk about the takeaway messages because you already studied this. You have this in your notes. Um, this is what we did. So much so that um, the plan of Chicago that came out of this exposition, which again used these axial boulevards and these grand monuments uh, as tools for changing the message. Right? This is a tool for, this is a project that transforms the system of urban organization that is a vehicle for a, a change in the culture. United States, the city of Chicago, is the capital of Western civilization and high culture, the highest achievements of mankind. We called it mankind back then. It was only partially constructed, but just in case you were curious, in case you're in doubt about the system culture part of the architectural project. This was a textbook that up until the 1990s. This textbook that came out of the, the plan of Chicago in 1907, uh, that the plan of Chicago produced a textbook that was a guide for the required high school course in, in civics. And so, this architectural plan produced a high school textbook for a required class. And there are still people walking around 
who took this class in Chicago in high school, uh, maybe all throughout Illinois. Um, it's another piece of evidence that supports this diagram of the interplay between these different forces. And we did it in Chicago, Washington, DC. All, and we used to spend a whole week on this. So it was the point of, uh, of uh, connection to uh, the analysis. It was the topic of analysis was the City Beautiful Movement. Please don't do City Beautiful Movement unless you're showing us a recent project that uses the ideas of the City Beautiful, the axial thing uh, that has been done recently that is an example that you think should be emulated in our practice moving forward. There now a slight side trip, and I think we did this. Tell, tell me if if we did this uh, in history theory too. There was uh, an art student who really, really wanted to be an architect, but he um, he couldn't pass the exam to get from the art academy into the architecture program. Uh, but these are his drawings. He, was constantly drawing buildings and he really, really wanted to be an architect, but he was rejected. And what do you do if you're an ambitious young man and you get rejected and, and pushed down? What do you do? Or you seek revenge and you take power. And uh, he, he also designed this very successful advertising campaign. He designed these military uniforms. He had a hand in designing the Autobahn highway system of Europe. He had a hand in designing the Volkswagen Beetle, the, the car for the people, the people's car, the Volkswagen. And here he is breaking ground on a, a, a highway project. And he kept being an architect. And part of his project to become the most powerful society in the world and through military conquest was architecture. So he was constantly working with Albert Speer, his, his buddy, the architect, to manifest this vision of a white supremacist world led by Nazi Germany through architecture. And when he was found dead in the bunker at the end of World War II, he was not exactly curled up around his models, but he was in the bunker next to the room where the models were stored. The models of his vision of uh, supreme Germany with the Third Reich um, to rule the world for a thousand years was his vision, was the complete transformation of the city of Berlin. And I don't know, did you see the, the series, The Man in the High Castle? Who saw that, The Man in the High Castle? It's pretty good, right? Saw that? The, basically, the premise of the story is that the Germans got the nuclear bomb before the atomic bomb before the United States. So they win World War II and they take over North America and Hitler builds this city. And some of the scenes in the movie are very convincingly portrayed in this architecture, including this dome, the largest dome. Um, it's as tall as the, uh, the Empire State Building. Uh, and it's basically doing the Pantheon, but bigger. If you could put the Empire State Building inside this dome, and they show it in The Man in the High Castle. I don't know if I showed a video of that in the lecture I gave, but this is the architecture and it's replicated in other projects of power. Uh, the colonial, the British colonial transformation of a new capital for India. They basically took the architecture of Paris, and they put it in the new capital of, of New Delhi. And then they decorated it with the uh, architectural forms of Mughal India. So they, they decorated it with uh, chhatris and all of those things. And we can study that in architectural history. So moving quickly through this, um, and you see where this is going, right? City Beautiful is here in this title. Where does this title come from? 
where did we, who did the sketch writing for the introduction to Jane Jacobs? So where did this idea of the radiant garden city beautiful come from? Did you catch that? No, I didn't. Who caught it? Oh, like it was yeah, and one other thing. The Radiant City. So it's, these are three distinct movements that we used to spend three different weeks on. But because of Jane Jacobs' introduction, what is she calling? She's the one who uh, coined this term. She said, she said, you architects. She was kind of an architect herself. She worked in an architectural office, but she wasn't trained as an architect. But her sharp critique that she portrays in that introduction goes something like this. You architects, you are the slaves to the outmoded models of prior generations. You are intellectually attracted to these diagrams. You have these abstract ideas that are all about the view of the city from above, as, as was being said before, thank you. That you're looking at the, the city as if it's a model on the table, and you're determining from this viewpoint whether things are good or not. Stop it. Stop imposing these uh, clearly uh, erroneous ideas about how cities work. Stop imposing it on us. I know that you like to study these, you like to study Corbusier, you like to study Ebenezer Howard, you like to study the same beautiful movement. But uh, wake up. Instead of looking at the world from above in these models, in these diagrams, as if you're in a helicopter, go down to the ground and walk through the city. Look at the city from the ground level. Experience the city at what it's like to experience the city at the human scale. Walk, don't drive at 60 miles an hour through the city. Walk through the city. And judge for yourself. Don't listen to your teachers. They're just replicating the defunct models of the past. Stop it. Decide for yourself what works and doesn't work. Does that sound familiar? That's, that's the manifesto for this course. That's the manifesto for how to do architecture in the 21st century. And her critique of what we used to do is she lumps together these things that we teach as three distinct schools of thought. She lumps them together into the Radiant Garden City and says, stop it. Just stop replicating this mindless model of how this oversimplification of how cities work. <clears throat> so we're going through how to recognize this overly simplified model. City beautiful move. This would be a good time to ask questions. Garden cities. What's the idea of the garden city? We used to read this, but um, that, we can't be bothered. Yes. Is aesthetically pleasing. The Garden City idea is let's take the best of the city and the best of rural life and put it together. Let's call it the city country model, the town country. People will be attracted. This wasn't, again, there's so many things that happen with transform architecture from people who are not trained as architects. The guy who wrote this, Ebenezer Howard, was a stenographer. <clears throat> a court stenographer, but he was thinking about these things. He drew this diagram, published it as a pamphlet, and it gave us, long story short, basically it went from Garden City, which had countryside mixed in with urban centers connected with regional infrastructures and lots of open space, which is not a bad idea. He called it the Garden City. Well, it was taken and implemented more as garden towns. So some of them have town centers. We're gonna look at those. But the main legacy is suburbia, which is um, 
not the best of both worlds. In a way, with the addition of the automobile, it's worse than the city and worse than the country. It's the worst of both worlds in a lot of, in a lot of ways. So it was built in England in the town of Letchworth. There was a series of new towns. Um, my son just moved to a town in Maryland called Greenbelt, Maryland. That was uh, the American version of um, the, US, the United States version of the, um, the, the garden city or garden town. And it's totally automobile dependent. It's pretty interesting. He has a bicycle there. We'll see how that works out. But these are the ingredients of the garden city, garden town, garden suburb. And uh, every city in the world had a garden city extension, a garden suburb that was added to the outskirts. And so some of these ideas, um, uh, one of the key ideas that is still, that will be talked about uh, where you were in the years to come is the idea of the neighborhood unit. And with the rise of the automobile, instead of Main Street being the center of town, we have to flip everything on its head. The place where there's traffic used to be at the center of town, but because traffic is hostile to human inhabitation, it has to shift to the edge. And the center of town becomes the least automobile dominated part. And that's the idea of the neighborhood unit. And so this is a walking distance. This is a half mile radius, to put it in a human scale. And so all the people who live here live within a half mile of the civic center. And they can get there by walking comfortably. And so this is a, a, something that is still referred to in architectural practice today, or it's, it's being referred to more and more. And today, what we have is we have wildlife corridors that allow moose and deer, instead of getting run over on the highway, they're allowed to go underneath. Yes. Yeah, what was the differentiation between good design and good design? Jane Jacobs argues that, like, well, this is like the design, it's not good architecture. Like, where did that differentiation come from? Well, how would you? Uh, I mean, the architecture schools and the architecture profession during the age of Jane Jacob uh, was fixated on what they were defining as good architecture. But we've shifted since then, in part because of Jane Jacobs' critique, to uh, bring architectural, uh, the, the standards and criteria of, art, of good architectural design into alignment with what humans need. When you go into studio, that's what we're talking about. So it used to be that good architecture was judged from afar. When I was in school last century, I was drawing a perspective and my professor came up to me and said, what are you doing? Don't draw a perspective. That's too, uh, that's too, that's too personalized. Draw an axonometric from above. So there was a strict enforcement of good architectural design being abstracted from above, not experienced from the human scale. So that's what I would say. I don't know, am I getting that right? You guys draw perspectives all the time. You have to draw perspectives. That's how you do good architecture. Phew. We've changed a lot since the 1980s when I was in architecture school. So this is an interesting analogy. Um, we now design wildlife corridors so that the moose and deer don't uh, get run over on the highways, it's mainly for insurance purposes. Uh, but a lot of people die, right? Some of you have been to Maine, some of you are from Maine, but that idea started with children. And you'll hear Jan Giel say this. If you wanna know if a city is working, look for the children. If it works for children, it works for everybody. And that fits with universal design. 
If it works for people in wheelchairs, it works for everyone. Sorry, Annex Central. Uh, if it works for the least able or the most diverse uh, members of our society, then it's gonna work better for everyone. That's where we're at. So this was designed in the 1920s. This is Radford, uh, New Jersey. This is a brilliant design where every house has a front that we're familiar with. It's where the car is parked in a driveway and a garage and a cul-de-sac, a street. It takes us, that in the 1920s, it took the man of the house needed to work. It was cis-normative architecture. The man works out of the home and gets there by car. The woman works in the home, unpaid work, 18 hours a day. Did you get that too? Yeah, there's a double I have it on Do Not Disturb. But I'm it's not. A, not it's a, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a government alert that's going to get past everything. Interesting. Someone just stole that. I don't know how to read that into the lecture, but I'm sure there's a way. Well, it doesn't work for children. Aha, there we go. Do you think any children? Thank you. <laughs> Maddie, you're just stacking up these points. Are you okay with her stacking up all the points? Is that okay with you? Yeah. She's, she's doing the work of all of you. Yeah. Do you think these, do you think little Contana Garcia would be abducted if she were here? No. Look, where are the parents walking the kids to school to make sure they're safe? Nowhere. The built environment made it safe for them to go to school on their own. The women have their women and children have their front of the house on the back, and what we call the back. They go out, they go to this path, and they take the path and they go to school. They don't need the parents to escort them. And this is what it looked like. There was the, the, the child and female realm, and then there was the car male realm, cis-normative urban design, which brings us to zoning. So zoning has a deep and long history more recently as an instrument of racial segregation. We, we pretend that that racial segregation is an unintended byproduct of of logical zoning designed to maintain property values. But we're just kidding ourselves. And, and Richard Rothstein has kind of unveiled that pretending. And we can't pretend anymore. Zoning is one of the foremost instruments of US racial segregation and responsible for creating a severe uh, discrepancy in uh, household wealth, whether you're a white family or a, a non-white family. And just look around the classroom, who would be here now in this classroom with us if we had addressed that years and years ago? So it's, it's, a, it's a now issue. It's not about slavery. Uh, it's not you know the ancient history. It is the history of the moment now and the future. And it's a very serious thing. So you would think that with all of this understanding of the problem of zoning, that we would have gotten rid of zoning. But the fact is that in the United States, we cannot get rid of zoning. Long story short, zoning is here to stay. So what do we do? We create zoning that we create new zoning layers that uh, dismantles old zoning layers. So these are, this is the origin of single use zoning in uh, Tony Garnier's, uh, the son of the architect of, of Charles Garnier's uh, opera house in Paris. He uh, really uh, pioneered this idea of historic preservation of the old town and then putting industry downwind from uh, the extension of the new town. Some of this is a garden city extension of the new town. That's where the garden city extension would go. And we create zones, single use zones. This leads us quickly to 
Corbusier's um, radiant garden, radiant city. Um, I think you saw this in history. This is all look familiar from history theory too. The takeaway of this is that Corbusier uh, and the Congress, the International Congress of Modern Architecture, codified the rules of the four functions of the city. There are four functions of the city. What are they? Who can read the slides? I bet it's there. The four functions of the city. Caitlin. Dwelling. Wait, what was it? Dwelling, work, recreation, and transportation. It's really three zones. And then the connective tissue to get us between each one. Because you can't work where you dwell, single use zoning. And you can't recreate where you work, single use zoning. So they are long distances away from each other. And we create spaces between those uh, dwellings. And we free up the ground plane. We replace the ugly, unhealthy fabrics of these cities with the healthy fabrics of these, the new radiant city. So here's the answer to that question we posed about Alice Hayward Taylor. Uh, why does why does Alice Hayward Taylor not orient towards the street infrastructure? It orients towards the sun. This is called the Zeilenbau uh, idea. We embraced it. Buildings are liberated from the street facade. Buildings are objects that look good from an airplane and look good as models on the table over there. We architects are up above the models and we look at it and say, this is good. We're not walking on the street next to Alice Hayward Taylor and saying, whoa, whoa, where's my pepper spray, right? We're not, we're judging it from above. And so the idea was you, you get rid of the streets you get rid of the street experience. You get rid of the outdoor room experience and you replace it with object buildings surrounded by open space that we call gardens. We call it towers in the park, but it has become towers in the park being lot. That's what we have with automobility. And, and so we got rid of the outdoor room experience of the social space of the street and we've replaced it with motorways that go between the object buildings. And so that is the takeaway message of the radiant city. It builds on the garden city idea, it builds on the city beautiful movement ideas, and it adds to it this idea of large, tall towers in the park, Inglot, and the street is gone. There's no more street wall. There's no more eyes on the street because there's no more street wall. There's no more outdoor room. It is a motorway. The streets are now motorways. And the city, the quote from Corbusier is a city built for speed is a city built for success. So, um, the punchline and the positive stuff. And I think we we did this. Um, I sent you a link to a video, the Peter Calthor video. Uh, honestly, just I won't look at who's raising the hand. How many people did not watch it? I did not watch it. I'm not going to look at who it is. I'm just looking at. Okay. So I'm going to guess that two thirds of you did not watch the Peter Calthor video. Did someone, someone who watched it, was it good? To WhatsApp, to WhatsApp. I'm gonna send you another one. This one is from Jan Giel. Okay. 
Oh, oh, his name, the German architect during World War II, his Adolf name Hitler. was what? Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler, young man by the name of Hitler, Adolf Hitler. Okay, so I'm going to send you a link to a movie by Jan Giel. This is, this is the, the best stuff of the course in this video. Thank you, everyone.